Hey everybody, and welcome back to the next part in my Creating a Great Tone series for our Line 6 Helix. Today I'm gonna to dive into a topic I've been asked about a lot, and, and honestly, I should have probably got to this video before now. Uh, there always seems to be something else to do. Um, this video is going to be all about something that's not even necessarily specific to the Helix, uh, but is very easy to experiment uh, with uh, within the Helix. Uh, it's going to be about effects order and placement within our signal chain. It's a question that a lot of folks have, and up until the recent years where, where modeling has kind of uh, really, the popularity has really exploded, uh, it, it, it was always a difficult thing to experiment with because, you know, we'd have our physical pedal boards, <laughs> you know, pedals Velcroed to them with uh, hopefully, you know, neatly cut, uh, cable lengths and whatnot, and all of a sudden we have to start swamping orders, right? Yeah, we can get some longer cables and just start, you know, making this big spaghetti mess of cables as we as we uh, change the order of our effects. But it just wasn't an easy thing to do. Possible, yes, not easy to do. But so I think a lot of folks were always a little shy and standoffish um, to really experiment a lot, and they just go with kind of what the uh, conventional wisdom or what somebody told them was the best way to order effects. Now, there is some conventional wisdom that goes along with this, and there are reasons why certain effects should be placed in certain uh, places within the chain. Having said that, I want to put a big disclaimer right off the bat before we even get started with this. By no means am I saying that there's only one way to do these things and only one place to put a specific effect. You know, I'm not saying, oh, reverb always has to be here, delay always has to be here. Ultimately, what it always comes down to is what sounds best to our ears or what is accomplishing the particular sound that we want for whatever particular situation we want. We've all heard guitar tones that on, on, on maybe some famous recordings, even classic recordings that at first you know, if, if we had played through them, we probably went, that is awful. It's terrible. You know, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, but it became a real signature of that song. Right. So, and a lot of those tones were oftentimes created through great experimentation and breaking of the so-called quote unquote rules. Right. So there really are no rules. And even if there are rules, they're sometimes made to be broken. Right. In, in cases like this. So what I want to do though, is just take a little bit of time and go through some of the possibilities. And it's so easy to do in Helix with the ability to just move effects around, right? And we'll talk about why maybe some of the conventional wisdom became so-called conventional wisdom as far as placing certain effects in certain orders. And others are gonna be very subjective, right? It's gonna be up to us. Uh, and, and our opinion or our tastes, right? I mean, everybody's going to like something a little bit different and that's wonderful, you know, otherwise we'd all sound exactly the same and who wants that, right? So let's dive into HX edits and we're gonna take a look at a very simple patch I put, it's not, I don't even wanna call it a patch, it's just an amp and a cab. I'm using the German Mahadeva as I have right here. And I've really done very little to it. Um, there's no effects on it whatsoever. I, I took the 112 lead 80 cab um, that it defaults to, and I think I changed the ribbon here to a one, uh, sorry, the microphone to a 160 ribbon with five, five inches off. I don't really know if I did anything at all to the tone stack other than bringing the drive down for now to get it to be clean. So why did I get it to be clean at first? Well, this is interesting because a lot of the effect placement or effects placement um, on a clean amp is not going to be quite as important, okay? A lot of times the important thing is how the effects are going to interact with overdrive and distortion, okay? Okay, so I've dropped in a teardrop 310 wall and let's just hear how that sounds before the amp, okay? We're on a clean sound here, so we'll hear the effect of that. Now the beauty of the Helix is I can just simply drag that and move it after the amp, right? Let's hear what that sounds like. Before. After. Okay. I don't think anybody's going to say that there was a dramatic difference between those two placements of a wah pedal, 
Okay, so you might say, oh, great, I can just put effects wherever. Well, no, because this is what I was alluding to before. With a clean sound, it's not quite as important, right? Because the effect is not going to be interacting with any overdrive or distortion. So let's see what happens if I take the drive. I'm going to bring the channel volume back considerably. I'm going to bring the drive up on this. I'll just turn the wall off for a second. <laughs> Okay, so there's a bit of a distorted sound. Huh? Now let's put this wah back on and use it before the uh, amp. Fine. Now let's move it after the amp. Takes a second. Okay. Do you hear the quite dramatic difference in the tonal quality of that wah now? Now, conventional wisdom is, is that we normally want to run a wah somewhere near the beginning of our chain, right? And I think we hear why. It kind of has a more dramatic effect. It works nicer off of the clean signal of the guitar and then letting that interact with the distortion rather than the other way around. Uh, let's try a different wah. We get a less dramatic effect with it after the distortion. Right? Now, here's the beauty of this. Some folks watching this might say, yeah, I like it before. And some folks watching might say, I really liked it after. And that's the beauty of it. If it's, it's as simple as dragging it before or after our amp. Now, what if we're using a clean amp with a distortion pedal before it? Well, it would be the same effect as putting it before or after the distortion pedal, right? So it's really about where the distortion is coming from. So if we're using a clean amp with a distortion pedal, any effects that should be put after distortion would go after the distortion pedal or after the amp would be fine, but after wherever the source of the overdrive and distortion is, if that makes sense. So, okay, so that's the wah pedal. Let's move on and try something different. Let's talk a little bit about distortion then. Let's go back to our amp settings. I'm gonna bring this uh, way back again. So we get a nice clean sound. Um, and I'm going to change this block, this dist uh, wall block, to a distortion pedal. Let's go with something that's pretty heavy, like a vermin, maybe. Okay. I'm really not spending much time dialing the sounds in. I just want to use default settings just to get us get us going with it. Okay, so a distortion pedal before an amp. That sounds pretty good. Turn it off. There's a the sound of our amp. What happens if I drag that after the amp? I don't think we're gonna get too many arguments. That's pretty uh, awful distortion sound. Now again, if that's what you want for a particular effect, then by all means, there's how you get it. But I think for the most part, that's not the sound we'd be going for, right? We put that in front of the amp. All right, so that's going to be the same for all distortion pedals. So, so far we're thinking, okay, wah pedals, somewhere near the beginning of the chain, probably before the distortion. Uh, distortion, pretty much always before the amp, right? Okay, let's talk a little bit about compression. And this is an interesting one because I've had so many folks say to me, uh, in my videos where I always put a compressor at the end of the chain. 
where it's compressing everything, kind of like a mastering section, I've called it, like a glue, right? Um, I've had so many folks say, well, you shouldn't be putting a compressor after reverbs, after delays, yada, yada, yada. And my whole point of that was I was never using the compressor in a very heavy-handed way. It was very mild settings, more like what a mastering engineer would use to glue everything together. So I actually did want to put it there, and I knew precisely what I was doing to do uh, by putting it there. Having said that, if you're going to do fairly dramatic compression, maybe say like a country player would play to get that really um, snappy sound, uh, usually you want that over towards the beginning of the chain also, right? So um, if we take this deluxe comp and let's set it so that it's going to be fairly dramatic here. Uh, pull that way back on a clean sound. <laughs> Okay, so we really hear it kind of snapping. So if I drag this after the amp, what you're going to hear is quite a dramatic difference in the way the compressor reacts because it's getting a very different signal going into it. So it's probably got a lot more output, therefore this threshold is going to really clamp down on that new signal it's getting. So if I raise the threshold. It's probably not gonna sound much different before or after. Now, if we put a bunch of effects before it, you've gotta keep in mind everything, every effect that we feed into another effect, whatever's last in the chain is gonna apply its processing to everything else before it, right? So if we do put a compressor at the end, that compression is going to be on our delays, on our reverbs on uh, our, our modulation effects, on everything, right? So, you know, even at the beginning of the chain, if we have this at the beginning and put it after a wah pedal, right, then it's going to be compressing the signal that the wah is changing, right? Uh, if we put it before the wah, it's gonna be compressing the direction coming from the guitar and then the wah is gonna be getting the compressed signal, if that makes sense, right? So we're gonna to have to use our ears for uh, some of these situations to make sure that we put it where it best suits our needs, okay? Let's clear that out. Um, same with EQ, I'm not gonna go through anything here with that, I usually put my EQ towards the end, again, for that mastering kind of an effect. But again, having said that, if we put an EQ after our delays and reverse and modulation, Every change you make in the EQ is also going to EQ our reverb tails. It's going to EQ our delayed echoes, right? It's going to EQ every other effect. So that's a decision we have to make personally. Now, what about modulation effects? Let's dive in here and throw on just a chorus, let's say. Now, again, if we're dealing with a clean sound... <laughs> Let me drag that after the amp. That was before the amp. Very, very subtle difference, if any. So again, when we're dealing with a clean sound, the placement of a lot of these effects is going to be less important, right? It's when we add distortion. So let's come back over to our overdrive and get some, some distortion. <laughs> Good distorted sound going here with our German Mahadeva. Okay. So what we're hearing there is the chorus before the amp and the distortion. Without it all together, it would be this. Let's hear how it sounds when put after the amp and the distortion. Before. My personal preference with most modulation effects is that I like them after the distortion. 
they interact nicely with the harmonics that are generated by the distortion and they give a very different character. I find, and some people may disagree with me on this, but I find when they're placed after the distortion, the effect is more dramatic. You're going to get a little bit more of it, maybe a little bit smoother effect, okay? And I think that's what you kind of notice here as well. Um, so again, there is no right and wrong. It's just, I think, the fact that we educate ourselves about what actually happens when we put it here or when we put it here is where the power lies because then we can instinctively create chains for the particular purpose that we're trying to, uh, or the particular end result we're trying to accomplish, if that makes any sense. Okay, so let's take this and change it to another modulation effect. Let's go with like an optical trim. Okay, so this is before the distortion. <laughs> Just make it more so we can hear it. So if you notice, when it's before the distortion, we almost don't notice the effect when we first hit a chord or a note. It kind of slowly comes in. Now watch what happens when I move that after the distortion. Right away, we notice the effect, right? It's interacting with the, the distortion, the harmonics from that and giving a more dramatic effect, like I mentioned with the chorus. So if that's the effect you're looking for, you'd want to put it after the distortion. Before again. See how it's more subdued, right? It's not quite as dramatic. Right, so that would be a trim. Um, what else do we have here? Let's just run through a couple. Uh, phaser. Don't want to play that and get a copyright strike. Um, <laughs> let's move it after. Quite incredible difference, eh? Again, before, very subtle effect. Maybe that's what you want. After. And obviously there's, there's so many parameters we can play with within the effect itself to change all of this as well. But I think you're starting to see the point here is that before the distortion, the mod effects are much more subdued and subtle after they're a little bit more, the interaction with the distortion really gives them a more dramatic effect. Um, let's go with the flanger. Again, I'm, I'm, let's just pump the regeneration up here. Okay, so before the um, distortion. <laughs> Move it after. A little more of that sweeping effect coming through, right? Before again. So a little bit more dramatic effect again, but knowledge is power here. Knowing in beforehand what placing it before or after the distortion is going to do allows us to more instinctively create our patches for the end result we're after, right? So we did chorus flange, uh, okay, a ring modulator. Pretty bizarro effect, but again, I think you'll see. Move that after. Right. 
again, it's going to be personal preference, right? Okay, so that's our modulation. Now let's talk about delays. Okay, let's go with just a, uh, let's say a transistor tape here. Um, we'll do some, I'll leave it pretty dramatic so we can hear the differences. Uh, let's see. Okay. Think already what you're hearing there. You got to remember now, what we're doing is we're feeding a delay into distortion, okay? Usually conventional wisdom is that we put our delays and our reverbs close to the end of the chain after the distortion. What's happening right now is our signal is, is getting processed by the delay and then causing those echoes, and then those echoes are being fed through distortion. So not only is our original sync signal distorted, but all of our echoes are distorted. And that's why you don't get, you get a very rough edge. Maybe it's what you want again, right? This is gonna be our personal preference, but you can hear it here. <laughs> You see how those delayed delays, those echoes are distorted. Now, if I pull that after the distortion, do you see how it smooths it out dramatically? I mean, we got a lot of feedback going on there. A lot of mix too. Right, again, if I put that before, we now had distorted echoes, which is probably not something we want. Much in the same way that it's going to work with reverbs. Let's uh, see, right now we're feeding our reverb through distortion, right? If I move that after, do you hear how the, the reverb tails are clean now, right? Nice clean tails on that. Very distorted tails. Maybe it's what you want again, right? It gets pretty nasty, but again, sometimes that's good. more pristine reverb tails. Now, what about using delay and reverb together? This is another question that is asked quite often, right? We'll pull up uh, this again. Transistor tape now feeding into the reverb. So again, our delayed echoes are going to go through the reverb. Therefore, our direct original signal will have reverb applied to it, as will all of our echoes, right? That might be something you want. That's how I usually do it. But again, there's no right or wrong here. What happens if we drag that delay after the reverb? Now we get the reverb on our signal from the amp going into the reverb, but the echoes won't have that reverb applied to it again, right? Maybe if we want our, our echoes on our delay to cut through the mix more, we don't want the reverb on them because that'll help them sit back in the mix. So again, it just really depends on the scenario and there's no right and wrong answer for this, right? So let's start with a harmonizer, just a uh, simple pitch. I don't know what this is going to sound like because uh, it's uh, just default settings, but let's see what we got here. Huh? <laughs> Okay. The thing about a, uh, the harmonizer is conventional wisdom is that we want it to work off of the most pristine signal so it can track properly because it's taking the note that it's fed and it's trying to create another note accurately to go along with that, right? So if we feed it a distorted signal that could also have a lot of harmonics being generated, it might get confused and not know exactly what to work off of. Again, having said that, if you use your ears and try it and like that more, then by all means, go with it, you know? But for the most part, you usually see most people putting their pitch effects or harmonizing effects towards the beginning of their chain again, right? So that's, here's how this would sound. Here's the, the, um, the harmonizer before the distortion. Here's the 
Here it is after the distortion. Before. Much more dramatic effect when it's working off of the distorted tone. Okay, how about a whammy pedal? Here it is before. Let's just up this to 100. What happens to that sound if we move it after? It really alters the original pitch, right? Because it's working off of, in the case of it being before the amp, like I said, that pristine, unaffected signal where it can really track it and know what it's hearing. Whereas after the amp, after the distortion, it's working off of something that is not as pristine with lots of harmonics, right? So it's going to affect, uh, uh, it's going to um, act in a very different manner. So, so again, I think just you know, like I said in the beginning, what a what a wonderful situation we have here. Um, in that we can experiment so easily by just simply dragging and dropping different effects into different positions, and we get to hear the results right away. We get to make this decision, yes, this is what I want. I, I find a lot of folks, though, when I'm talking to them online, it's almost like they feel afraid sometimes to try these things, right? And I always say, just give it a whirl, right? Use your ears. Trust your ears. You're the one who has to be happy playing through this in the end. And if you're not, that's going to affect your playing even, right? If you're not comfortable, we all know it. We've been in situations we're playing through a rig that we're just not feeling the sound that it's not what we want and it does it affects our playing and that that goes for you know even the most seasoned veterans to beginner players we have to like what we're hearing so ultimately it's up to you to decide and I think this knowledge here is power if we actually sit and and, and a b different selections we can make informed decisions based off of what we like to hear and uh, so that's what I'm trying to do with this video not so much saying you must put it here you must put that there now, having said that, I, I get a lot of people would ask, you know, yeah, well, you know, you went through a bunch of modulation effects and you went through tremolo and you went through flanger and phaser and chorus. Now, what if I want all of those in a row? That's a very good question. Which one are you going to put first, right? And that's not something I can really answer because, first of all, for I would say for most situations where somebody's just running a normal live patch or maybe in the studio, if you have a chorus on, that's probably going to be you know, one of the only modulation effects you'll have on at any given moment. Again, I don't want to say that because somebody will come along and then say, no, oh, I always combine a tremolo with a chorus. And that's wonderful, right? But then that's going to be up to you to try the different order. Do I want tremolo going into chorus or do I want chorus going into tremolo? Listen to both and see what you like. But I think for the most part, a lot of times what will happen is a lot of those effects, we're probably not going to have a trem, a phaser, a flanger, and a chorus on all at the same time, unless we're going for some real dramatic effect. Well, in that case, an experiment with what you think makes that dramatic sort of atmospheric or, or synth-like effect, if that's what we're going for, sound the best, right? And put in whatever order you want. But for the most part, if all we're ever going to do, and this is, I guess, my long-winded point here, if we're ever going to only just use one of those at a time, it doesn't really matter what order they're in, in relation to one another, right? If we have a chorus and a flanger and a phaser on, but we only ever have the chorus on by itself without those other two, and they only ever have the flanger on without those other, it doesn't matter what order they're in. It's just going to feed through. As long as we put them before or after the distortion in the place that we want, then that's going to make a lot of sense. So how would I create, using this, a very quick patch that would maybe be a good all-purpose type of, a, of a, a distorted sound, right? So I would maybe come and say, okay, right to my first chain, I'm just going to grab a wah. And I'm not going to play with any of these. Uh, let's go with teardrop wah. Uh, I'm going to move this over a bit. Okay, I'm going to come right to the end. I've already put path two, uh, path one going into path two. I'm going to come and I'm going to slap the LA Studio comp on like so. 
move that down. I'm putting, um, sorry, did I, I'm using mono here. Let's, let's make it stereo, what the heck. I'm going to go to my next block. I'm going to go to a stereo parametric EQ that I could possibly mess with after with my patch. But right now I'm just going to put high and low cuts, go 90 and 12K. I'm going to come on here and throw up a legacy reverb. I'll put a 63 spring. And these are just sort of my instinctive settings that I feel would probably work fine. I'm going to come after my distortion and I'm going to throw in a chorus. Uh, I'll turn that off for now. Uh, I'm going to throw in a flanger. Turn that off for now. I am going to throw in a deluxe phaser. Uh, what did I put in here already? Chorus, flange, phase. And, uh, and of course, I had to go and do those all in mono. Eh? See what happens when you work fast and you don't pay attention to what you're doing. Eh? Anyways, you get the point. I'm not really trying to create a patch. I'm just trying to show you how I would maybe order my effects, right? Um, over here, I'm going to throw in a... Actually, what I'm going to do is move that over. And I'm going to throw in a uh, simple pitch and uh, do, do, do. I don't know maybe I'll throw a deluxe comp in here doesn't matter if it's mono or stereo because it's before any of the uh, stereo effects uh, you know what else what else uh, whatever it's going to allow me oh I forgot to put a delay in so I'll come in here with a delay do a stereo delay I really like the uh, transistor tape you know Something like that is going to work for me, right? Because I already know what the effect of these things is, is going to be like. And what I can then do is go down into uh, stomp mode on my Helix, touch the, um, the uh, switches, uh, the capacitive touch switches, there's the word I was looking for, and assign these to different switches. And I've got my pedal board set up in minutes, right? And then obviously you're going to go in and tweak these to however you want them to sound. But, but anyway, so... I hope that kind of helps you guys. There's not really any patch I'm going to put up or anything for this. I think, you know, I didn't really do anything here to make it sound a certain way other than just explain how certain things interact with one another. Um, there, there's some great resources online. I think Strymon, uh, who makes just some amazing uh, pedals, they have a... Uh, a good article up on their website about effect order and whatnot. And there's other good articles on online about it. But the beauty of the Helix is that we can so simply go in and experiment and figure out what it actually does when we put certain effects in certain orders. And we can listen and hear the effect of it right away and make our decisions um, based off of you know, reality, right? Without having to go through this mess of changing cables and whatnot. But I hope some of the examples I gave you sort of opened your eyes to why we would do certain things. And I hope I explained that clearly. Anyways, any, any questions or comments, please leave them for me. I'm always happy to try to answer when I have the time to. And I hope you guys enjoyed that. And I hope it helps. I, I really do. You know, it, it was a question I've had a lot. And I, I, like I said, I should have got to this uh, before now, but I, I hope that does help some folks. So please subscribe to the channel if you haven't. Like the video, share it. I really appreciate all your support. And I'm going to be back with a lot more uh, content in the near future. I uh, hope you guys are doing well. Thanks for tuning in and we'll talk to you soon. Ciao for now.